to chair the next one. Somebody else. No, you didn't. Uh, you can if you want, but I, yeah, the idea was I will chair. No, no, I, I could you do it? Yeah. Yeah, of course, we'll chair now. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so unfortunately, I think we have to to skip the break because um, Henriette has some um, time constraints. Um, first of all, it's nice to okay. see you. We can we can pass for a minute or so if people need to. Do we need a break? Uh, uh, fine. Henrietta, you, you are co-host. Can you try your slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Can you see? Thank you. Okay, then I suggest we just move on. Um, so it's a pleasure to have um, Henriette Elvang uh, from Michigan here. And um, so she's going to tell us some um, some ideas and um, on soft limits and double copy. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. It's really a, a pleasure to be able to share these results uh, with this audience. So I'm going to talk about soft limits, uh, some work that lies a little bit back and then quickly show how that motivates us to study a uh, double copy. So celestial amplitudes uh, came originally motivated from soft limits. And so very briefly reviewing that when we take a four vector uh, momentum to zero by scaling with some epsilon, then in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, the photon amplitudes behave with a leading one over epsilon squared and a subleading terms and uh, subleading terms that are universal. And similarly for gravity, the way we take the limit, the leading term scales as one over epsilon cubed, as was found by, by Weinberg very long ago. And more recently, Cachasso and Stromander showed that there were sub and sub subleading universal terms. The particular form of these soft factors won't matter for this talk. The key point is that they're universal. So these statements are true for three amplitudes. And the obvious question that always came up uh, some years back was what happens at loop level. So at loop level, things are tricky because massless particles create IR divergences in the loops and you have to regulate and then you have to figure out the limit of taking the soft limit versus the limit of the regularization or the regulator. But one question we wanted to address was at least we could try to figure out if massive particles running in the loop could modify any of these universal factors. When you have massive particles in the loop, it's natural to integrate out the massive states and look at amplitudes that have only massless external states, but then the information from the massive states are encoded in higher derivative operators. So that means analyzing the same questions of photon and graviton soft limits in the case of generic effective field theory. And that was what was done in this paper from 2016 with my then graduate student Callum Jones and Stephen Ashulich at Bowdoin. So what we found was that there are new terms in the soft limits. They enter for photons at the subleading order and for gravitons at the sub subleading orders. And they arise from a very specific set of certain cubic field EFT operators. These results could be derived from what we call the master formula. And this master formula captures the divergent parts of soft limits so anything that goes as epsilon to a negative power of an amplitude. This is looking like a maybe a little bit complicated. It's written in 4D spin helicity formalism. And we take the posit positive, a positive helicity particle soft in a holomorphic fashion. That means that we scale its angle spinners, but not its square spinners. And vice versa for a negative helicity particle, you would take the square spinners uh, soft while keeping the angle spinners. So that would be the reverse. What that does is that it takes into account that amplitude scale homogeneously uh, with little group scaling. And this sort of removes the trivial part of the scaling that arises from the group. Okay, and that's why in these soft limits, the orders, whereas this is really just one over P, it scales as one over epsilon squared as a, an, at one over epsilon cubed at the leading orders. Okay. Now, this formula here was derived from very basic principles, essentially just locality and unitarity, and that came in in a very particular fashion. It entered because of the following. We know that cubic interactions are the only ones that give, give rise to divergent soft limits. So if we have the soft leg entering here on another leg, then the way that the soft limit diverges is that as the momentum of S goes to zero, 
the internal line here goes on shell, and that's what creates the divergence. If there had been more lines, so if this had been a four-point vertex, for example, the internal line would not go on shell as S goes to zero, and therefore that does not create a divergence of limit. So it's clear that from the analytic structure of amplitudes at tree level, we know exactly where the divergent parts come from in the soft limits. The other thing we know is that tree amplitudes factorize on their symbol poles. So as illustrated here, for any lake K that S can interact with, you can factorize in the limit where that line goes on shell, you can factorize it into a three particle on shell amplitude and an endpoint on shell amplitude when the thing you start with is N plus one points. Moreover, we know that three point amplitudes of massless particles are uniquely fixed by the particle helicities. They're fixed essentially by the little group scaling and locality. So putting these things together, we know exactly what this is based on the helicities of the particles we take soft and the thing that it interacts with and the internal line state. And that's really what this formula leads to. You have the end particle amplitude here. This term here is essentially what comes from the propagator that's going on shell in the limit where uh, this auxiliary variable Z goes to zero faster than epsilon goes to zero. And then there are some factors here that essentially arise from the free particle interaction. You see that it depends on the soft momentum S, it depends on the momentum K, we sum over all momentum channels, and uh, we sum over helicities that can go into it, and it depends on another auxiliary reference spinner X. There's also a sum here over various quantum numbers, so C is just a collective index for that. And this entirely captures the divergent behavior in the amplitude in the soft limit of a single particle going soft. Now you notice that when this variable A that sits here, which just depends on the helicities of the particles that in, are in this three particle interaction, the soft particle, particle K, and the internal particle that is exchanged, when that variable is greater than one, there appears to be poles in one over Z. But as I mentioned, Z is an auxiliary variable. So an amplitude cannot have pole in a, such a place that's unphysical. So a pole at Z equal to zero would be unphysical. And so it must be that in the sum here, the residues of all those one over C to some power poles vanish. That leads to very physically fundamental results by analyzing that master formula, namely for photons, it leads to charge conservation for whatever they interact with. For gravitons, it gives us the equivalence principle. We can show results such as massless spin, higher spin particles, cannot couple consistently to gravitons that obey the equivalence principle. And massless spin three halves must couple supersymmetrically to gravitons. By the equivalence principle, they must couple to gravitons, but moreover, they must couple supersymmetrically uh, in the sense of obeying the susie ward identities. These are all well-known statements, but one thing that is nice here is that they're all derived from the same compact formula, namely by avoiding that there's no pole at Z equals zero. Then expanding out the master formula and collecting the terms that are ordered C to the zero power, that leads us to the universal soft theorems I showed on the first slide. And moreover, it allows us to precisely specify which free field effective field theory operators contribute at the subleading order in the soft photon theorem and sub subleading order in the soft graviton theorem. Let's think about soft limits more generally. So when I have a particle that goes soft in this holomorphic fashion, so a positive helicity particle that I take holomorphically soft in this way, then the tree amplitude will generally behave with some uh, at some leading order epsilon to the sigma, where sigma is what we call the soft weight. So the examples that we've seen here is that photons have sigma equals minus two and gravitons have sigma equals minus three. If you study the same for gluons and yang mills theory, you find that they, like photons, have sigma equals minus two. So those are examples of amplitudes with divergent soft limits. And in order to have divergent soft limits, you must necessarily have free particle interactions as we discussed. There are of course also amplitudes that vanish in the soft limit. Those are said to have vanishing soft limits. And that is often, though not always, the case for Goldstone bosons. And that is something that, for example, in the context of pions, we know as atlas zeros. Examples of this are exactly the low energy effective field theory of pions, chiral perturbation theory, for which uh, the amplitudes vanish as epsilon to the first power. So that's an example of one nonlinear sigma model that has that property. There are born infeld, direct born infeld scalars 
that have vanishing soft limits that have an enhanced softness. The direct one infill scalars are the gold cell modes of the spontaneously broken transverse translational symmetries of the brain symmetry of the translational symmetry transfers to the brain. And the enhancement comes because the brain also breaks the Lorentz and, and rotational symmetries that mix the brain direction as well as the transverse direction. So that's actually what gives that enhancement. And another example, the example that we know that has the highest vanishing power of soft weight, sigma equals three, and the unique one that has it is called the special Galilean. Finally, of course, there are also models that have sigma equals zero, so they go to a constant in the soft limits. Examples of this is born infill theory, so the vector theory of a space filling brain, or the supersymmetric vector component of supersymmetric BBI. There is the n equals two supersymmetric CP1 nonlinear sigma model, where the scalar model in itself has vanishing soft limit, but when coupled supersymmetrically with an n equals two multiplet that these scalars sit in, there are cubic interactions that actually reduce the softness to sigma equals zero. Another example is conformal BBI which is as opposed to this case here with the vanishing soft limit that are highly enhanced for DBI, that is a brain in flat space. Conformal DBI is what you get when you put a brain in ADS. So these are some examples of soft limits. I want to highlight two cases here. Gravitons have sigma equals minus three, gluons sigma equals minus two. But one of the things we have learned over the past several years is that there's a very important relation, at least at three level, and, and in certain cases, perhaps at loop level also, between gravity and yang mills theory, namely the double copy. What it says, and I'll stay here just at three level, is that yang mills three amplitudes double copy in the sense that sums of a product of these yang mills amplitudes give rise to graviton amplitudes. Now, because gravity blue ones come in both helicities, you can also get a certain scalar particles in four dimensions, or more generally in B dimensions, you get more states. And that's why you have gravity plus, it's really an S and S gravity. So gravity with a dilaton and an anti-symmetric two form. Okay, sorry, I have, a, uh, I have a little problem with the window showing up here, but we're okay. All right. Um, I lost control of my cursor, give me a second. I will be right back, yeah. So based on this double copy relation, one might have suspected that the gravitons should have sigma equal minus four soft limits because as product of yang mills amplitudes, you would imagine that the softness simply adds up. On the other hand, we know that they have softness minus three. And that's because the double copy is not just a product of amplitudes, it's a product that is sort of put in together with a certain kernel, which are called the double copy kernel which as an example here at four point is simply the Mandelstam variable S. So whenever I take any one of my lines soft here, S will also go to zero and that's given an extra enhancement of softness. And that's the one that gives you that minus two, minus two plus one is minus three. More generally at end point, something similar happens. Here's the form of what the double copy looks like for three amplitudes in what we know as the KLT form in the field theory limit. So here's a left amplitude. You can think of that as a Young-Mills amplitude. Here's a right amplitude that could also be a Young-Mills amplitude. And then there's the thing that we call the KLT kernel, which in general is some function of Mandelstam variables. This formula came originally from string theory, from Kavai, Lavellin, and Tai. And this field theory limit that I'll talk about primarily today arises from the alpha prime going to zero limit. So these are three amplitudes that enter and they generate the product amplitude on the, on the left-hand side, which in case of yang mills times yang mills is, is that gravity plus amplitudes. And so here is an example of how this works. There's a sum here over color orderings. These amplitudes here, the left and right ones are color stripped amplitudes. That means that we, we, we take off a single trace color ordering that contains all the, the generators of the color group. And then we're left with a kinematic object that is gauge invariant. There are in general, because the trace is cyclic, n minus one factorial such choices. But the sum here is in the KLC formula is only over n minus three factorial of those n minus one factorial options. So there's a sum here over color orderings and there's a choice. And that means that we sort of have a matrix of KLT kernels. And here's one example of one where A is one, two, three, four ordering of states and B is one, two, four, three ordering of states. And in that case, 
the ordering is just minus s, which is the formula that I showed you just here. So that is the KLC form. It's really remarkable that this formula works. And let me try to illustrate why. Then amplitude that has color ordering can only have poles in lines that are adjacent to each other because as, as we recall, they have to sit next to each other in the color ordering, they cannot cross over. So one, two, three, four ordering can only have poles in S, the one, two channel, and in U, the one, four channel because they're adjacent, but not in one, three, so not in the T channel. And similarly, the one, two, four, three amplitude can have poles in S and T, but not in U. Graviton amplitudes, of course, have no color structures. So the graviton amplitudes will have simple poles in S and T in U. So how could a product of these amplitudes possibly get even the pole structure of M right, let alone getting the right residues at these poles, and at the same time avoid double poles? And the answer to that is, of course, because of the kernel. And I want to give you two examples to illustrate how nicely the kernel actually works. So the first example, we just had a kernel that was minus S. This works precisely the way it should, because the product of these two amplitudes here they do have the S and the T and the U poles, but it doubles up on the S pole and that doubling up is exactly canceled by the kernel factor. On the other hand, if I took the first amplitude I listed and multiply it by itself, so the same amplitude comes in on the left and the right, I'll double up on the S and U channels, but the kernel makes sure to cancel them so it doesn't, it doesn't create something with a double pole, but only a simple pole. And then we also noticed that the product was missing the T pole and nicely, the kernel supplies that. So the kernel plays two important roles. It eliminates double poles from the product of the two input left and right amplitudes, as well as it provides the missing poles. Another important aspect of field theory KLT are the so-called KKPCJ relations. Let me illustrate what they are. So I gave you two different forms of the double copy based on two different choices of the color orderings at four point. There's only one graviton amplitude, so these have to be the same thing. And so if I subtract them from each other and factor out the one, two, three, four amplitude, then I see that there has to be a relation between the two ordering of the amplitudes. And that relation is proportional to a factor u over t that ensures that these things exactly have the right poles. This is an example of a PCJ relation at four point named after Baron, Carrasco and Johansson who first noticed these relations in their PCJ form of the double copy, the color kinematics version of it. And of course this relation happens to be true for yang mills theory because otherwise the double copy wouldn't work. If you look at other color orderings of the amplitudes, there are a set of other relations that must be true uh, in order for the double copy to be independent of the choice of N minus three factorial uh, choices of color orders in the sum. Those are the kleist kloist relations, which are simply the free trace reversal identities, the U1 decoupling identity, as well as the BCGA relation I just mentioned. So these amount to five relations on the six independent cyclic orderings at four point of four lines. And so that reduces the number to one, which is also N minus three factorial. And that's the general picture. And these are I'll refer to combined as the KK BCGA relations. Such relations also exist more generally at n point. And the KK relation generally reduces the number of color ordering from n minus one factorial to n minus two factorial, whereas the BCJ relations further reduce that n minus two factorial to n minus three factorial. And n minus three factorial is exactly the number of color orderings you need here, and that's no coincidence. Okay, so now the rule of the game is that in order for this double copy product to be basis independent, i.e. independent of the choice of set of A and B sums over, then you must have imposed the KKBCJ relations. And basically that gives you a selection, a selection criterion for exploring the space of field theories in the sense that you can ask for a given field theory, does its tree amplitudes obey the KK and BCJ relations? So in some sense, that gives you a new way to slice the landscape of field theories, which theories can be the left and right input of the double copy. So we already talked about the Yang-Mills theory uh, does the job. Supersymmetrization, so pure Yang-Mills theory does the job. And chiral perturbation theory, the nonlinear sigma model that is low energy model of pions also does the job. And in fact, we can write a multiplication table for the double copy. We have here our familiar Yang-Mills times Yang-Mills is an S and S gravity. Supersymmetric versions of this double up on the supersymmetry 
So n equals four super angles times angles gives us n equals four super gravity. N equals four times n equals four super angles famously give us n equals eight super gravity. Um, chiral perturbation theory with angles gives one n felt. If you add the n equals four supersymmetry, you get n equals four supersymmetric DBI, the lower energy effective theory of, of on a D1 brain, oh, on a D3 brain. And then, of course, chi chiral perturbation theory with itself gives this theory called the special Galilean, the one that I mentioned had the highly enhanced soft uh, behavior. In general, the number of states in the double copy will be the product of number of states in the left copy times that in the right copy. And the helicities add as people who are familiar with little group will, will see that it, they simply, the helicity adds of the state that you put in. So the product of a positive and a negative helicity glue on will be a scalar in the double copy. For example, that is how you obtain all the different 70 scalars of n equals eight supergravity. Um, and that's also how you can see from the softness on this map is that the kernel enhances, just as we saw in our four point example, the softness by, uh, uh, by a level of one. Okay, and so you could go through to the slide where I had uh, for, for many of these theories here, the soft behavior, and you can see that indeed this holds. Now, when you see a multiplication table like this, at least I'm transported back to my first algebra class. And you, know, we, you would ask often if there's some kind of algebraic structure in such a product. So we basically have a product rule on a space of subsets on, on the space of some subsets of field theories that obey KKBCJ relations. And they map you from that space into another set of field theories. Are there certain algebraic properties of this? The first thing you might think about as an algebraic identity would be something that would play the role of an identity element. Something that double copies with itself gives itself back and which double copies with a right theory, any right theory that obeys KKBCJ to give itself back and likewise for the left theory. So let's ask if such a thing could possibly exist. First of all, let's think about the color structure. First, the color structure is that we have single color structures in the left and the right sectors. And we fold that in with the KLT kernel to produce something that has no color structure at all because we summed over all the color orders. So in order to have something that double copies to itself, you need something that transports a, a, double, a, a color structure over to the other amplitude so that it can actually be the same. And it turns out there's a very simple and easy way to do this, which is to have a double color structure. So the color structure here that participates actively in the KLT double product is the alpha and beta double uh, color orderings. It acts in the exact same way as you have with the product rule here. And then you have two inert color orderings, gamma and delta, that just will be inherited by the amplitude in the double copy. So we can see that this actually has a chance of working. So we need some model, some field theory that has a double color structure. What else does it have to do? Well, remember that the number of particles that came in uh, in the double copy product was the product of the left and the right input. So we want that to be the same. So therefore there can only be one state. Moreover, the helicity is at, so that one state would have to be a scalar. There's just simply no other choice. And to have a scalar with a double color structure and a similar structure to the yang mills amplitudes and so on, it's really natural to have a single scalar in a double adjoint representation. So it carries adjoint indices A and A prime of two color groups that we could think of as UN and UN prime. So two non abelian groups. The softness adds. And so since we only have one state, sigma left times right must be the same as sigma left, which must be the same as sigma right. That leads us to this equation, which implies that the softness of this theory must be minus one. If we want the same softness to hold, and that's, that's what we're trying to do, right? Now, softness minus one means that we have to have cubic interactions. And for scalar theories, there's really only one cubic interaction up to field redefinitions, and that is phi cubed. You can't put derivatives on there because Mandelstam variables vanish in three particle kinematics. Or in other words, you could always remove such an interaction with derivatives at three point into higher point terms. So three, phi cube is what you gotta do. So we need a double color structure, a scalar field in a double bi adjoint uh, or bi adjoint representation, and then cubic interactions. What could those cubic interactions be? Well, we really have two choices. We could contract our scalars adjoint indices with the fully anti-symmetric structure constants or we could contract them 
with the fully symmetric ones, the ones that show up in typically in anomalies. You can't combine the Fs and the Ds because that vanishes with symmetric and symmetric contractions. Now you could plug in to this identity here and ask which ones of those examples will actually map amplitudes to themselves. And it turns out that there's one answer. It has to be this one. That model is known in the context of the double copy as the cubic by adjoint scalar model. And I'll abbreviate it here as the BAS model. It has a very simple Lagrangian. It has a kinetic term and it has the cubic term with the contractions into the anti-symmetric structure constants. So that takes care of the idea that one equals one times one in the double copy. What about the rest of the algebra? Well, it turns out to work. The bi adjoint scalar amplitude, in, in now enlarging the table I showed you before, and other examples I would say n equals one, n equals two, super n mills, and so on, the bi adjoint scalar model exactly acts as the identity element. So that means that we have a KLT algebra which has an identity, and that identity is the bi adjoint scalar model. Now, string theory also has an identity element. And in the alpha prime expansion of that, you can find that that is the bi adjoint scalar model plus a very specific set of high derivative operators. I'll come back to that shortly. Let's now think about the double copy in EFT context. We know that Yang Mills theory satisfy the KKPCJ relations, and these other models do too. So, what now about higher derivative operators and EFTs? So, this was studied early by Dixon and Brodel, and they found that phi cubed, uh, sorry, not phi cubed, but f cubed as a, as a trace f cubed operator in Yang Mills theory does obey the KKPCJ relations. But f to the four, no matter how you attempt to contract the indices, does not. Here I'm showing the count of the number of such single trace operators that exist that contribute to the plus plus minus minus amplitude at four point. So just what is called the MHV counting. Um, and there's one contraction of that uh, for MHV and it doesn't work, but the other one don't either. At higher derivative order, we find that there are two operators that are at a level D squared F to the four. One obeys KKBCJ, another one does not. And similarly, you can go to higher points fairly trivial and just check if the amplitudes obey it. One out of three does at the next order and so on. Similar for chi PT, it's a two derivative phi to the n type of theory that obeys the KKPCJ relations. At the next order, d to the four, phi to the four, no operators obey, and so on. You see there's a clear selection principle by the KKPCJ relations. So why are some operators allowed while others are not? And is this really the most general story that we could imagine? In fact, you might be puzzled that F to the four is not in part of this because open string theory has this operator. So shouldn't it be generated? And the natural thing that happens is the following. So what we're trying to do is to double copy Yang-Mills theory with higher derivative operators. We'll say Yang-Mills theory with higher derivative operators to get some kind of uh, and SNS gravity with high derivative operators. But why shouldn't we also not correct the kernel? That seems like a logical step to do. So we should include high derivative corrections in the double copy kernel. After all, string theory does that. So what does the string theory KLT relations look like? They look like exactly the same, except that they now erase the closed string amplitudes to open string amplitudes. And that the kernel that sits here is something that depends on alpha prime and it's the string KLT kernel. An example of the form it takes is uh, that what used to be minus s in our description before is now minus sine of pi alpha prime s. And when you expand a small alpha prime, you see that the leading term up to the constants that can be absorbed at pi alpha prime into s, those are exactly the, the by adjoint scalar model kernel that we talked about before. So this the standard KLC kernel we talked about before. And then we see that the string alpha prime corrections give us other higher powers in the kernel. And they are very specific. They're specific in the fact that they come from the expansion of sine s, which means that they're only odd power in s, no even powers. And you might also wonder why there's no t or u dependence in this formula. So what is so special about the string's kernel? If we're thinking about this double copy, then as we add generic higher derivative corrections on the not just the ones that arise from string theory, but corrections with generic 
or at least as they are allowed by KKBCJ relations with some coefficients, we should also imagine that we need a kernel with somehow generic coefficients in the tidal derivative expansion. But then what are the rules for generalizing the KLC kernel? So what should a kernel do? Well, it should do the job that it did before. It should eliminate double poles in the product of the left and right input amplitudes, and it should provide missing poles. And then it's also quite important that it doesn't introduce spurious poles, because after all, it's important that what we get out on the left-hand side here is indeed a tree-level amplitude of a local field theory. So that, that is certainly a constraint on this. So in our work from the summer, we propose a new framework for systematically analyzing generalizations of the double copy kernel, and we call that the KLT bootstrap. And that is with a postdoc, uh, Juan Hang Chi, my now fourth year graduate student, Aiden Hereske, a former student, Callum Jones, and Sruti Paranchapi, who are now postdocs. And this proposal is based on the algebraic structure that I described before, the KLT algebra, namely the existence of an identity element. So here's the summary of how it works. So the identity element, of course, has to obey that one times one equals one. But you can easily imagine that if you change the kernel, if you change the multiplication rule, then the identity element also changes and vice versa. And so that means that the kernel and the identity model are uniquely linked to each other. What that does is that it creates a KLT bootstrap equation for what is allowed in terms of modifying the kernel. And we use that to determine the kernel. And then these two relations, the left multiplied by identity is left and the same for similar for right, that generalizes the KKBCJ relations, or in the case of you think of this in terms of strings, these are the strings monogamy relations that are generalized. I'll not derive that aspect here, uh, but it's, it's given in full detail in, in our paper. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about what it means that one times one equals one. So we have this relation before, a double copy sum that models by adjoint scalar model that, that maps by adjoint scalar model to itself. We can see that this is clearly matrix multiplication. So in a matrix form, we could write this as Mn equals Mn multiplied as a matrix multiplication with a sub matrix of kernel elements times another sub matrix. And all of these are N minus three factorial sub matrices because this is, these are all sums of N minus three factorial color orders. When we set it up this way, I could take this equation and multiply by the inverse of this MM from that side, and then the inverse of that MM from the other side. That leaves me the kernel on one side, and on the other side, I end up with a very simple expression, namely that the kernel is simply the inverse of MN. This was actually noticed by Cachasso and collaborators in form in, in this, from, from the CHW form, that the, that the KLT kernel is in fact simply an inverse submatrix of three level amplitudes in the biadron scalar model. Okay, so now we know what it means that the kernel is uniquely linked to the identity element of the double copy. Here's an example of how it works. The biadron scalar amplitude are doubly color ordered. That means that the diagrams that you can write down have to be compatible with both orderings. If the orderings are the same, as in this case, we can have both the S channel and the U channel. But if they're not the same, you can see from these two color orderings that the only diagram that is compatible with both is the S channel diagram, not the T, because that's not allowed by the first color ordering, and not the U, that's not allowed by the second one. And so we only have the S channel, and there's a minus because the couplings depend on the anti-symmetric structure constants, and there's a flip of lines here. The inverse uh, here is just the inverse element because n minus three factorial is just one for four point. And you see that this generates exactly the kernels up to the factor of one over g squared that uh, I mentioned earlier. So this gives a very clean picture of what these are. And, and of course that was noticed by Kachasa and, and his collaborators. What about the strings kernel? Well, Misera found that the string KLT kernel is also an inverse of a submatrix of amplitudes. These are amplitudes that look a little funny. Uh, you replace the usual one over S and one over T and so on by one over sine of pi alpha prime S or a tangents in certain cases. Uh, that do not look like something in a local theory because it has a lot of funny poles. But when you expand an alpha prime, you immediately see that what these amplitudes are is nothing but the biadjoint scalar amplitude plus terms that arise from local 
uh, higher derivative interactions in the biatron model. But of course, as we discussed, these are very particular higher derivative corrections. I could easily have imagined also having a t-dependence here. I could have an s squared. I could have had a constant. There's something that makes us ask, why is not that not allowed? If I want to double copy things with generic Wilson coefficients, shouldn't I also have by at your scalar model with generic type of higher derivative directions? And so the question becomes now, which terms are allowed in the by at your scalar model plus higher derivative terms? It may appear from what I've said that we already taken care of this constraint one equals one times one, uh, uh, but there's actually a little bit more information of this, and that's why it gives us a bootstrap equation. So we saw that the kernel is the inverse of an MN submatrix. When I plug that back in, I don't necessarily satisfy this equation because I could have picked different types of color orderings uh, or, or subsets of N minus three factorial uh, objects. So let me illustrate how. So I pick for my delta and gamma, the one, two, three, four ordering. So these are inherited here and here. And then for my A and B in the sum over color orderings, I pick, uh, or alpha and beta, I pick one, two, four, three. So different color orderings. Now we see that here's a, not an automatic cancellation. And in fact, I can rearrange this equation to make it look like the vanishing of a certain two by two determinant. So if I look at the six by six matrix of all the possibly cyclic in cyclically independent color orderings, of the bi adjoint scalar amplitudes, possibly with high derivative corrections, I see that the identity element condition exactly becomes the vanishing of all two by two minors. So what that says is just that this six by six matrix must have rank one. If you plug in the amplitudes for the bi adjoint scalar, they do have rank, this matrix does have rank one. But if you add generic higher derivative corrections to that, then you find that generically it will increase the rank. And so if you want a consistent low energy limit where as you take those high derivative corrections away, you can't have the rank of the matrix change. And so we must have a rank one system. And that way it becomes a bootstrap for determining Wilson coefficients in that effective by adjoint scalar model that give you a, a matrix of amplitudes that have rank one. How does it work? Well, here is the first row of amplitudes in that six by six matrix. They might look like six different functions, but they're related to each other through cyclic symmetry and momentum relabeling. So there's really just three functions, F1, F2, and F6. And in terms of these three functions, you can write the entire six by six matrix. Now, with that input, the six by six matrix generically has rank six. So we have to impose the vanishing of all the two by two minors, and that can be captured by three simple equations. The first one says that F6 has to equal F1. Actually, that's a reversal identity that we have right here, similar to the KK reverse, trace reversal identities. Then it fixes F1 in terms of F2 as this very simple ratio of the function F2 with different input. And then there's a self-consistency condition on F2. And once you put in that these three equations are satisfied, that six by six matrix has rank one. These three equations are solved for the biadjoint scalar. They're solved for the biadjoint uh, strings scalar plus higher derivative amplitudes at finite alpha prime, as well as in the expansion, of course. And then you might ask, what else solves this? So you write the most generic ansatz for F2. We don't have to worry about what the Lagrangian look like. We'll reconstruct it later. But we put in that we have our cubic interaction. We know that's the one that's allowed. And then we can have a constant with some Wilson coefficient A0, 0. zero. We can have terms that are linear in S, linear in T, higher powers, et cetera. So we just write systematically with generic coefficients. We then solve these bootstrap equations with the additional condition imposed that whatever you put in from the F2 to get an F1, that F1 has to be a local amplitude. So it is not allowed to have spurious poles, only physical poles. That fixes a bunch of the coefficients and ends up relating some of these higher point coefficients to the lower point ones in a certain pattern. And here is the result of what you get. You can see that the constant term is not allowed. You have terms that are linear in both S and T. And that in particular already is more general than what you have in string theory. In string theory, we recover the strings kernel by up to powers of alpha prime and so on. We set A11 to be minus one six and A10 to be zero. 
A2 zero has to be zero. A3 three is minus seven over 360. All these other A3 uh, zero one two coefficients must vanish and so on. So clearly this new double conic kernel is more general than the strings kernel. What is the local Lagrangian that this arises from? Well, here I've written the leading order terms, the ones that are at two derivatives and phi to the four. So d squared, phi to the four types. We have in the first line here, the usual by adjoint scalar model. And here are all those operators at the same order. So there is one term here that has only anti-symmetric structure constants. And then the two other terms are sort of left to right identities or flip identities. So they uh, have both the Fs and the Ds in, in non-trivial contractions. We see that despite the fact that we wrote this as three operators, there are only two independent constants. So really there are only two independent operators here. Okay, so let's just absorb what was going on here. First of all, we saw that the D contraction at cubic order was not allowed. We mentioned that before, but now we have a systematic way of understanding why. It's simply because such a term does not obey the rank one bootstrap equations. There's also no phi to the four term. Why? Because it does not obey the rank one bootstrap equations. Then an interesting point here is that the, the two symmetric tensors that appear in the last two lines here, they will modify the U1 decoupling identities. This is actually quite familiar from the strings versions of those KK relations, which are the strings monotony relations, that they do modify the U1 decoupling. And in fact, we see that because the term, the second line here, that does not modify the U1 decoupling, because it depends on a left and a right, the coefficients of these terms that do modify it, you can never have a term at this order while leaving the U1 decoupling identity. It must be modified at this order, or you have to go to higher orders. Now the known strings kernel has a left equal to a right. So it treats the left movers the same way as the right movers. And in some sense, we can think therefore of our version of the double copy kernel as a heterotic type because it can treat the left and the right differently. For example, if I put a left to zero, then I end up having KKBCJ relations for the left sector that obey the U1 decoupling identities and on the right sectors that modify it. So it treats left and right differently. And in that sense, it's heterotic. And then there are of course also higher order terms that we have not written out here. Okay, so now let's apply this thing. So here is the example of what you get after imposing the generalized KKPCJ relations, which follow from the algebra. There's the usual Yang Mills term. And there are also pole terms that arises from two F cube vertices. But now as a new feature, which is also familiar from string theory, there's now allowed to have an F to the four, but its coefficient is fixed. Just like it's fixed in terms of alpha prime in the strings from the strings kernel, it's fixed in, in terms of the coefficient that sits in the kernel. And here, there's also allowed both in the usual way and, and otherwise a d squared f to the fourth term. And similar for the right sector. You can just sort of get an overview here of what is allowed in the usual field theory KLT versus in the generalized one. We see we still have a selection principle, but more is allowed. Similarly for chi pt. And one small remark is that if you use the same kernel, these operators have Wilson coefficients that are fixed by the same number in the kernel, the same coefficient. What do you get when you double copy this? Well, you get your usual Einstein gravity. Then you get a pole term that arises from exchanges of dilatons as well as axions when you have left and right couplings generically not the same. And then you have the next term here. This is a large coefficient, which encodes the coefficient of the local R to the four term. That is in the usual field theory double couple generated as a double copy of Yang Mills times the D squared F to the four operator. But now we see that we have a new contribution that vanishes in string theory and shifts the coefficient of that R to the four term. And that, uh, that is what has a coefficient that comes from our generalized kernel. So in all cases we've checked, we get the same operators, but the shifts of the coefficients. I have a comment about that later. Let me briefly mention why a point. So I bootstrap that four point to find a more general kernel. The five point kernel will have input from four point due to factorization. So what happens if I bootstrap at five point and end up fixing those four point coefficients? Then I'm a little bit in trouble because maybe I have to go to six point to figure out what is really allowed. 
So it was important that we could go to the next order and check if there were any constraints in the four point coefficients AIG. What does this involve? At five point, there are four factorial distinct orderings. If you use cyclic symmetry and momentum relabelings, all 24 by 24 uh, number of input amplitudes are fixed by just eight functions. You impose on that system the rank two conditions that correspond to the bootstrap equation and then solve order by order in the model stun expansion. We found a consistent solution for the bootstrapped five point by adjoint scalar plus high derivative amplitudes and it placed no constraints whatsoever at four point. In fact, up to quadratic and up to including quadratic order and model stumps, the five point amplitudes are completely fixed by the four point input and including the local terms that enter in the Lagrangian. And then we had a test for this at quite some high order for the five point uh, Yang Mills plus high derivative terms in the self uh, dual sector. So let me summarize. So we investigated the algebraic structure of the KLT multiplication rule. And then we found a way that this naturally gave us a double copy bootstrap. We solved it for this, what we call minimal rank condition, which is the same rank of the system as in the usual KLT formula and the strings one at four and five point and tested various examples, Yang Mills as well as Kai Pt. And the summary is really here. We have a bootstrap equation for the KLT kernel. And then that gives us the generalized KKPCJ Omanaka relations. There are a couple of interesting things to discuss in the outlook. I mentioned that in all cases, the double copy generates the same high derivative operators, but with shift and Wilson coefficients. We're currently trying to understand if this is just a low dimensional effect or low point effect, or whether there's something more fundamental. And one way of approaching this is to study some similarity transformation for certain hybrid double copy models. And that's some new work with a, a now second year student, Alan Chen, that hopefully we can, we can share soon. I showed the example here of solving for the kernel as by adjoint scalar plus higher derivative, but that might, that, that, but the framework we have here is more general. And in fact, we could examine, because it's based on the algebra, it's more general. We can examine if there are other forms of the double copy without the cubic by adjoint scalar interaction, something that will have different behaviors for fixating the soft limits. Or is it, is it that such things don't exist and the minimal rank is truly fundamental? We don't know the answer to that yet. But we have studied an initial set of non-minimal rank examples. And what typically occurs there is that when you go to high enough points, six point, eight point, then you start finding spurious poles in the kernel. That's not devastating because that could cancel in the sum over amplitudes that they double copy. And in certain cases it does, but we don't know if that can always proceed and it certainly imposes additional constraints. Um, there's been some other work recently by uh, Carrasco's group at Northwestern and sorry, yeah, and, and then, then that recent work on high derivative terms and color factors, and, and that is not in the KLT formalism, but in the PCJ form. So they have some finite cases of that, and we have been able to compare to their examples and translated a few, but this relationship deserves to be, to be studied more. Actually, let me mention one example of such a finite kernel solution. So if I took my example of, of what I gave you before, so I have my biadjoint scalar model, but now I say LF to zero. So I have the U1 decoupling modifying term in the, in the right sector, and then I just truncate off. Then I have an exact solution to the bootstrap equations. The kernel for a sample looks like this. It has the usual form that we're familiar with. And then it also has a, a second contribution, high derivative contribution. The left amplitude satisfies the usual rules. It takes this form. And the right amplitude has a higher derivative correction that comes from an F to the four. But when you double copy these, the contributions that came here from F to the four is canceled in terms, it canceled by the kernel. And you end up with a double copy that is just usual gravity. So you get Einstein gravity from Ian Mills, times Yang Mills times F to the four. This is a little bizarre, but it is one of those examples where something that looks like a weird kernel with weird poles actually ends up having a sensible double copy anyway at the low orders. And so this is one example of trying to see what, what actually relations that pertains to both these questions, which operators are generated and what is the relation to the BCJ form with high derivative terms. 
Related to this is also that it, with a more general kernel, we end up shifting the Wilson coefficients in the double copy. But we also know that UV completability imposes certain comp comp positivity constraints, and similarly, the EFT hedron does that for the Wilson coefficients. And so it would be an interesting study to see how that imposes constraints on what the kernel might be, and if we can use that to narrow down what makes the strength kernel special, or from a low energy bottom up point of view, what makes strength theory special. And finally, we know that the double copy has a celestial version too, as, as seen uh, first, I think, by Casali and, and Andrea. Boom. And so a natural question is if there now is a celestial formulation of the double copy bootstrap. So I'll end by thanking my collaborators, uh, Callum Jones and Sri Paranjapi, who graduated recently both, uh, Aiden Herdeske, who's in his fourth year now, uh, Wan Hang Chi, and uh, Steve Masiewicz at Bowdoin. So thank you to all of you. Uh, happy to, to discuss and, and talk about uh, this more. Okay, thank you very much for this um, very interesting talk, Henriette. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, so I don't see it. Um, I have a question. So uh, to what extent did you use um, transcendentality? I mean, you know, it was a string kernel. First of all, the string kernel only depends on, on the Bernoulli numbers, which is uh, which are theta, I mean, even theta numbers. Um, and they in particular make sure that um, there's no R to the five term. In, in Yeah, so, uh, so that's not team. an input because we, we don't, we, we're going completely bottom up. So you are completely, so um, you, are, you have a completely, we completely general answer score. With, with completely generic coefficients, we allow, we allow anything from a bottom up field free point of view. But mm -hmm. then we can, of course, the, the Sphinx yeah. case should be a subset of what we have and we can just simply match yeah. to mm -hmm. the Sphinx kernel. And then those numbers will of course show up in, in that match. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so yeah. so it's not an input, but we can we can certainly match to it. But it is of course an interesting question if now we start imposing positivity constraints or other constraints that that assume that this completely bottom up approach has a sensible UV completion. If that narrows us down to see that type of relationship between coefficients that we know from string theory occur, and right. that that is that has not been done. Mm -hmm. Um, I see uh, one more question by Alok. Hi, Henrietta. So my question was about the higher order sub theorem. So is there, is there a way to understand why the under double copy, the subleadings of graviton theorem is universal? I mean, we know that the subleadings of gluon theorem, you know, for this higher dimensional effective operators will be modified, but somehow um, we know that the subleadings of graviton theorem is universal. Is there a, is there a way to check this or does yeah, it- I mean, so, so, I mean, we, it, it, it comes out of the analysis, at least when you, when you just have the massive states, right? Also in the effective field free approach. So, so you could have a little bit of intuition that certainly the leading order shouldn't be corrected because no. when you have higher derivative operators, of course they will have their additional softness. So it's even maybe surprising that you even get corrections at subleading order for the soft photon theorem. Yeah. But it's only for a little small subset of operators. Once you have too many derivatives in these operators, it just can't happen. It yeah. just can't kind of do it. Under double copy, uh, I mean, is there obvious why the graviton subleadings of graviton remains universal? I mean, you know, when you um, yeah. No, no. I mean, so, so I so that's an interesting point, right? So, so you can ask in the double copy. We know that it has to produce the right amplitudes with the high derivative terms, and and we can ask, of course, if correcting the kernel could correct the soft theorems. Right. And, and the answer is that, that it really, really can't <laughs> because we know from the generic point of view and EFTs that no matter what you have, there's only corrections at the sub sub leading order for the graviton. Right. And so right. no matter what I do in the kernel, it's going to be so sub leading that I can't do it. I mean, do, do you see what I mean? But that, in the, in the, but the, the, the sub gluon theorem is modified. so. So how, how is it happening that the, you know, if I, if I, if I look at the left side theory as the effective, you know, modified by the effective yeah. operators, like, yeah. Yeah, so, so, how, so there is, um, 
So the, so the double copy relations have a number of magic properties and, and what you mentioned might be one of them that even if the soft gluon theorem has modifications, yeah. certain things can cancel out in the double copy. So, so examples of this is not just that the enhancement of the softness that we know, but also that sometimes certain global symmetries are enhanced. For example, it's, it's sort of magical, yet Jang Mills theory times chi pt gives born infill theory because born infill theory has electromagnetic duality in four dimensions. And that translates at the amplitude level into that only optical helicity, uh, optical helicity has a whole. So, so in terms of all outgoing states, the number of positive helicity states, negative helicity states has to be the same. But obviously gluon amplitude, you can have MHV amplitudes at any number of velocity and any number of multiplicities. So I can have endpoint amplitudes with two positive and, and N minus two negative velocity states. When you plug those velocity amplitudes into the double copy formula mm -hmm. with chi PT, you get zero. I see. But it had to be to get one N felt, but it somehow is almost magical. Right. Maybe there's something similar for the subleading soft theorems that, that, that I, I don't know how it works, but it might be fun to sort of try to look through. Oh, thanks. Okay, we have um, one more question by Andrea. Um, yeah, so maybe the first question. Hi. Um, so you had this uh, relation between the soft weights, between the, the, the theories that double copy, and uh, you had the, KK, the KLT kernel give a contribution of one to save uh, well, to save the, the, the equation, essentially. Is that always uh, the, the contribution or is there a gen more general uh, expression from the contribution from the KLT kernel for other double copy theories? So, so for any KLT kernel that is, say, by adjoint scalar plus high derivatives, this will be the case because that's just set by the by adjoint scalar leading term. The other terms are subleading when we solve, so that doesn't change anything. But we can ask if there exists other versions of the double copy that does not have a bi adjoint leading term. And those will have different properties. They would not necessarily have that uh, plus one enhancement in this softness. But we haven't found anyone that looks fully consistent at all orders. Um, but that's still something that we're looking at. And the other question, so in the beginning you had this uh, multiplication table and now you just told us that if you add high derivative corrections to young mills, then it doesn't change the fact that you get gravity out. So there is some sort of, uh, um, I don't know if redundance is the same, is, is the correct word, but is there another dimension in this table now that says you can modify things here and there, but there will always be the KLT kernel that, that, uh, that cancels that. Is there an understanding for the other uh, entries of the table there? Um, Beyond the yeah. uh, sorry, what exactly do you mean? You, so, so, sorry. Yeah, so you showed young meals uh, uh, times young meals plus uh, this high derivative corrections double copying still into gravity because the KLT kernel cancels that uh, yeah. uh, contribution. What about other uh, other examples of double copy? Is there a general oh, understanding or that, just that example? example that so, so, so the example at the end was sort of a little bit special. The one here where I end up having the kernel cancel the high derivative correction, but in generically this doesn't happen. Generically, I do get this. This is just a very special example where I truncated off the kernel and I truncate off the high derivative expansion. But generically, that doesn't happen. Generically, I'll have the whole set of expansion terms, and then I do generate high derivative terms in gravity too. It it could be that there are other examples of this where I go to some higher orders. Um, but this is just one case we, we started looking at because we were curious that the BCJ approach by, by JJ et al, that it had a finite truncation, whereas we always work you know, at, at, at effective field theory as, a, as a, just like solving the rank condition up to a certain order. And so it was curious to find that we can truncate that orders and find solutions. And then when you double copy it, it, it sort of just cancel out. Um, but we don't know the systematics here at all. Um, so, so we're trying to understand a little bit with, with Alan uh, using, using certain ways of, of transforming from the usual bi adjoint scalar kernel to one with higher derivative corrections using some similarity transformations. So there's some interesting algebraic structure there, but there's still a lot to be understood. But there are also a lot of tensions between the requirements of, of wanting these kernels to arise from local field theories versus you know, moving things out. So the strings kernel has to have the structure it has because it's cleanly attuned to the open string amplitudes. The strings kernel actually has Fourier's poles in it, but it's canceled exactly by zeros in the open string. Mm 
it just works out. <laughs> so, so there's some very specific things there. And if I try to remove those high derivative corrections in the strings kernel by some transformation, then I typically get into some kind of conflict with, with interpreting my, my input as local, coming from a local field theory. Or even something that is analytic. Thanks. Okay, any, any more questions? Alok, do you still have a question? Because your hand is still up. I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot to do it. Okay, then um, I don't see any more questions by Henriette. Uh, so then let's thank her again and uh, um, for her nice talk. And we will resume at uh, 5.20.